hallmarks of rock and roll culture is its ability to tee people off. And Skid Row singer Sebastian Bach certainly qualifies as a rock and roller in the time-honored mode. We visited Bach recently in the New Jersey home where he seldom has much time to reside these days. And here's the kind of guy we found him to be. With the hard rock acts of the 70s and 80s now growing somewhat long in the tooth, New Jersey's Skid Row, fronted by singer Sebastian Bach, has helped return the music to its snotty adolescent roots. The group was started in the mid-80s with Bach, a Canadian who was working in Detroit at the time, joining in 1987. Skid Row's debut album went top 20 in 1989 on the strength of such teen-oriented hits as Youth Gone Wild and 18 and Life. The band has toured with Bon Jovi, Aerosmith, and most recently, Guns N' Roses. And its latest album, Slave to the Grind, went to number one. But Bach has provoked storms of criticism, too. First by wearing a t-shirt that said, AIDS kills fags dead, then by injuring a fan during a concert brawl in Massachusetts. Unusual behavior for the son of a well-to-do artist who was born in, of all places, the Bahamas. Your parents were hippies, right? Can we say that? Yeah, that I guess you could say that. Did you grow up with their music? I mean, did yes. you have that like pounded into your head? Yeah, mm -hmm. I can remember watching my aunt and my mom make French fries, uh, singing, "Let me stay next to your fire." <laughs> you know, all this. You know, what is that? That's rock and roll, son. <laughs> or driving in a van, listening to my dad sing, "This is the end," not realizing the lyrics. <laughs> Father, yes, son, I want to kill you. <laughs> Dad, what, what is this all about? Jesus. That's Jim Morrison, boy. <laughs> God, yeah, it's pretty interesting. Did uh, I wonder? Was there ever a point where you, like you came home one day and you were with a new like Motorhead album or a Kiss album, and your your folks said, "This isn't rock and roll." No. Oh yeah, my dad used to yell at me all the time because he liked punk rock in the in the late seventies, and I was into heavy metal, and he thought heavy metal was. Uh, he used to say. Heavy metal is capitalist. Why don't you listen to punk? Because it's socialist. And I go, it's too many ists for me, man. <laughs> you know, now I know what he was talking about, but at the time, because he thought that punk had something to say, yeah. and heavy metal didn't. You know, wow. it's kind of weird now because he sees that in the '90s, uh, you know, a lot of the same energy from punk has come into hard rock and given yeah. it kind of a kick. You yeah. know, because it's, it needed a kick after the '80s. Definitely. Yeah. When did you start getting into, into bands? I mean, do you remember when your first band was? Yeah, it was at private school. I was singing in the shower one day, and I was singing police, a police song called Walking on the Moon. Mm -hmm. and, um, in the shower. Okay. Yeah, one of, my, one of my buddies heard me, and he said, why don't you sing for our band? And I go, I, I never sang, you know, in front of, you know, people like rock and roll before, yeah. you know. And I did it, and suddenly, you know, the tall, geeky, greasy, <laughs> pimple-faced uh, guy that nobody wanted to talk to suddenly had tons of friends. <laughs> You know, I said, hey. It's a miracle yeah. that you bought this idea. Well, as, band, soon as, I did, as soon as I did that, I yeah. knew that's what I wanted to do. We used to play bars and stuff. Nobody would sign us up there because Canada doesn't really sign like yeah. heavy metal bands. But um, so I quit that band and then when I was 16, I moved to Detroit. Real nice town. Which must way. have been very different. How long did you stay in Detroit? I got out of there pretty quick. <laughs> yeah. And I said, if that's what America's like, I don't want, you yeah. know. But then I met these guys and it was very cool. Yeah. You were, were, you, were you supporting yourself all along? Yeah, I was singing beer commercials home? in Toronto. It sounds interchange, the studio. <laughs> what kind of beer were you promoting? Schooner beer. It's a Canadian <laughs> one. It sounds Schooner, eh? Can I have a beer? I gotta go out. I gotta go. <laughs> but I used to do that. Um, I thought it was like, you know, had a real good thing going there, singing beer commercials, getting paid for good it. Good bucks, right? Yeah, yeah, you do get paid quite a bit doing that. <laughs> you could have made a career out of that. Yeah, maybe I still will. <laughs> but, um, yeah, that's what I was doing, and I, I, I was getting a lot of like uh, offers to join American bands yeah. at the time, but I, I was just really happy, so I didn't want to, and, and Skid Row sent me a tape, and I was going, oh, man, I hope this really sucks, <laughs> you know, because I don't want to leave doing this right. Put it in, and I heard Youth Gone Wild, and I go, damn it, it's great! <laughs> Jesus! Now i got to make a decision! <laughs> you know? But the more I listened to it, I said, man, that is some serious music. <laughs> The, uh, the guys in the band, do you have to sort of work on your relationship, or has everything been pretty smooth? I mean, everybody understands that, you know, well, at what the beginning, is. At the beginning, because of the way this music industry is set up, it's like, uh, I'm sure people don't, you know, like rock fans don't realize this, but who's ever single gets released, uh, gets money, and mm -hmm. who's don't, doesn't get anything. 
that's fair, isn't it? You know, <laughs> you know, and all that. Uh, what we did with our second record, we said everybody is equal. Yeah. You know, and that way you fo focus more on the record as a whole and the band than uh, you know your own personal yeah. interests. So that took care of a lot of stuff, and 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 the attention that I had um, got as a frontman, you know, at the beginning was kind of strange. But in, in what way? Well, just because you know they want to be in the front. You know, <laughs> obviously, you know. <laughs> But, uh, you know, that, that, I think every band goes through that. Yeah. Had you ever met a guy named Rachel before? <laughs> Not a guy. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, I hadn't. What sort of name is that? Uh, a girl's name. Well. <laughs> <laughs> I call him Sophia Loren sometimes. <laughs> but, um, Why is he named Rachel? I've never been I don't know, but that. it was really cool because when I heard their tape and they sent it to me, um, you know, they put a phone number in there and I called him up and I said, what's your name? He goes, Rachel Bolin. I go, wow. <laughs> Heavy name, you know, Sebastian Bach, Rachel Bolin, Bachin and Bolin, rocking and rolling. I can see it now, you know. Just another name. Okay. But uh, now he's he, he's very into punk and uh, and Mark Bolin. People say, what do you guys do backstage with Guns N' Roses? I say, ah, knit macrame. Yeah, I uh, play chess. I have a couple sure. mean checkers game, man. Woo! Get pretty out there, crazy. Ah! <laughs> See, people don't know how to treat um, personalities that, that uh, sell a lot of records, but then remain true to what they were before. You know, they expect them to be big, but you know, you know, they expect, get out of my way, put up the red carpet. But if you, like, show up in a Volkswagen to the club, and you're like, ah, rah, 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 they go, oh, well, he, how, does he, how does he sell those records, you know? <laughs> but that's what I love about this tour, because it's like the 70s, you know, for the first three weeks, we didn't have a record out. They didn't have a record out for the whole thing, and it was selling out all over the place, you know? Yeah. It was like the spirit of rock and roll, because the spirit, I'm sure you remember going to concerts, you know, in the 70s, and yeah. when I was growing up, I used to go to concerts, I used to get the ticket, and I used to go <laughs> through the thing, and I was like being baptized, you know? It's like, oh my God, I'd be shaking the whole time, and there was this insane feeling yeah. every time you went to a rock show that I haven't experienced in a long time that we kind of brought back a little for yeah. this tour. What was the, uh, the, the trial in Worcester, Worcester like for you? I mean, was that just the world's biggest hassle? First, you have to wear a well, suit, Well, yeah. Right? Yeah, well, you know, when you go to jail, you know, it makes you think. Yeah. And I said, you know, all this, like, that was just a, an emotional reaction at the time, you know, because at the time I didn't have any distinction between uh, playing an arena and playing CBGBs. Yeah. And if I was playing CBGBs and I did that, Kurt Loder wouldn't have been talking about it on MTV, you know, because it didn't matter. But if you, you know, you can't do that. You can't jump yeah. in there and kick somebody's ass, you know. I'm not going to do it again. Yeah. If it happens again, I'll just like, you know, walk off the stage. I mean, I'm on probation right now for physical assault. And if I punch, you know, one more person, that's it. No more yeah. skid row, you know. So somehow I really don't think that's worth it, yeah. you know. So you're reining yourself in. Control your demons tour. That's what I call this. Control your demons. They come out, you know. And get down, get down, boy. You know. Uh, let's talk about this AIDS shirt because I think that mm -hmm. pissed a lot of people off or angered yeah. a lot of uh, AIDS oh, yeah, activists. What, what was what was going on there? You, were, you show up in a photo wearing a shirt that says AIDS kills fags. Dead. Right, <clears throat> right. Well, surely there's a story there. I mean, this is this is you know it won't seem. You won't believe this probably, but at the time, I swear, I did not know that anybody gave a flying whatever what it said on my chest you know what i mean that was like the introduction into responsibility for me yeah and uh you know I, actually it really hit home because one of uh one of my friends is a homosexual in new york and really really good friend yeah um and he just let me know exactly what it meant to him that shirt and i felt like you know fred flintstone in mr slate's office Whoop! <laughs> <laughs> i shrink it down in the chair did he call you up and explain that like no, this is he really got bad. me backstage and he was mad yeah. you know and he had every right to be because a lot of his friends died and that's not cool making fun of that yeah you know? where did the shirt come from so, uh, it was thrown to me on stage i i didn't even know what it said i put it on and said, uh, it's sort of you know <laughs> so it doesn't represent your no sympathies along no i mean i mean that's you know there's nothing funny about death when i ever no. said that 
you think to, you think things have maybe gone too far and everything you know what you know what also nailed it nailed at home was walking down a street and having a 12 year old guy in a skid row shirt come up to me and goes hey i hate faggots too oh. and i went ah wrong you know Jeez. that's a very wrong vibe to put out to people yeah so you've you think more about these things oh yeah i, I would imagine unfortunately yes i do <laughs> jesus you had you had a you had a son recently let's talk about him because mm -hmm. he's really cute i thought what you would you decided not to you were told i guess not to tell people you had a kid but now yeah, you, now you've come I mean, out it was, you, said you, had, you know, right? there's something really, really strange when you're respected, like, um, the people that like Skid Row respect us for being, like, honest about everything, yeah. you know, and playing music that is honest and, you know, not a big scam or a big front or yeah, anything. Right. So I found it very hypocritical when I would have my son out to see a show that I would have to go in uh, a different door in a hotel than him. And I said, this is over, man. I don't care. <laughs> You know, they said, oh, but all these chicks, you know, they really dig you. And I go, they're not stupid, you know. <laughs> really? They don't want to be, like, treated like a bunch of idiots. Yeah. You know, I, I think that people underestimate the intelligence of uh, yeah. rock fans. They, they figure, like, the people at record companies figure that they want to hear the same song done, written by the same guy with the same lead solo, yeah. with the same chorus, with the same lyrics. You know, and every front man is a rock hunk, and uh, you know he's in doom metal stud monthly. You know, and uh, you can't have kids, can't be a human. You know all right. this stuff. People are people, man. You know. So are you are you plagued by fans here at all? I mean, this is pretty remote where Sometimes, we are. Sometimes, yeah. How do they find you? I don't know, man. I get calls from like Alabama and Texas and how Japan. Do your, how do they find your number? I don't know. All you hear is this. Sebastian there? Who's this? <laughs> Click. <laughs> I'm like, ah! So you change your phone number a lot. Yeah, once a week. <laughs> well, I have a goofy line upstairs and a good line down here. <laughs> What's a so goofy line? You give it to the goofy people. 